luckily kind of two things happened for me there. One is that uh, Hyperloop One, which is the company behind this particular initiative uh, for Hyperloop implementation, uh, reached out to AECOM and actually hired us as one of their initial partners to help kind of think through this concept and design it and build it and um, and to help walk them through the process. The other is that um, actually my old college roommate works for Hyperloop One and he gave me a ring up one day. I was like, hey, you know, uh, we need some help thinking through this this large major infrastructure project. Um, do you think you can help us? And I said, uh, absolutely. I've been waiting for this chance my whole life to help you. And then from there, um, AECOM as a company worked with Hyperloop One for quite some time on a bunch of different efforts here and there about how we could help Hyperloop actually get something done on the ground. Around the same time, um, you're probably aware, but they launched what they call the Hyperloop One Global Challenge. And uh, that is the initiative that we're currently working through right now, which is Hyperloop One's effort to say, hey, you know, AECOM and other organizations are helping us kind of develop this technology. Uh, but once we have this technology ready, where in the world do we actually put it? And so uh, they took 2,600 submittals around the world. And luckily, um, uh, our team here in Texas, AECOM, uh, I'm the team leader for it, but it was a statewide effort. We put together a proposal. Um, AECOM Texas did on what this actual technology would look like in Texas, uh, how it would be transformative, and what the economic case looks like, what the uh, kind of physical and environmental case looks like. And then we pitched that as part of the 2,600 submittals, and we're fortunate enough to be a semifinalist as one of the final 35. Our AECOM Texas team that's involved with the, this Hype Blue One challenge effort is very multidisciplinary. It includes urban planners, engineers, architects, economists, general urbanists, um, other scientists. Um, so it's a true collaborative effort. We have sustainability experts. We have high-speed rail experts. Um, we have you know demogra demographers who look at forecasting populations, all working together on this proposal. Um, as we go through the process, we like to ask ourselves a lot of kind of bigger questions, and we try and answer those questions in the context of Texas. So we ask questions like, okay, you know, Texas, the mega region that we're looking at, what we call the Texas Triangle uh, for this region, it consists of five of the top eight fastest growing cities in the United States. Um, that's one of our big questions that we ask. And so we ask ourselves, okay, what happens when you allow five of the top eight fastest growing cities in the US to operate as one, truly as a mega city, if you will? So while there aren't any clear cut answers, it's on us to help ask those questions and try and answer them the best we can so that Hyperloop One um, can really be informed about what this type of technology and, uh, looks like on the ground and how it may influence the way we live in cities. Our AECOM team believes that Hyperloop Texas is absolutely going to be one of the winners based on kind of three primary factors. One, Texas population is growing dramatically. Everyone knows that um, there's a kind of a common statistic site that says by the year 2030, the population of Texas will be approximately 33 million, which is about the current population of Canada. So we have this great, strong, growing population, right? And a lot of that's built on a very strong economy. Um, that kind of leads into the second point I want to mention in that that very strong population growth obviously brings forth um, a lot of strain on our existing infrastructure. So we have very strained infrastructure, we have a lot of congestion, and we have air quality and environmental issues in Texas. Dallas and Houston are both what we call non-attainment areas, which means that we don't meet air standards qualities from the EPA. And the third uh, major reason we think we have a strong proposal is the actual physical distance between the cities themselves is very competitive for a technology like Hyperloop. Um, the distance themselves uh, line so that there is a market that uh, is, doesn't necessarily want to be captured by the airlines, uh, what we call short haul flights, flights between Dallas to Austin, you know, quick flights that aren't cost effective for them. And obviously on the other side of the coin is the distance is just a little bit too long for people to make it a convenient car ride. So you're kind of in this sweet spot in the middle in terms of the distance between the cities that makes it very competitive for a, uh, a market here uh, that would take something like the Hyperloop. If Hyperloop was to be implemented uh, for our proposal for Hyperloop Texas, we definitely think it would be kind of a supplemental system to existing transportation infrastructure. It's going to be really difficult, no matter how you slice it, to replace something like an airplane or an auto, um, a vehicle for driving. But it, it kind of captures this different market. Um, one is the, what we call the super commuter market. And those are individuals who travel over pretty great distances for work or for um, 
you know, they live and work in a different city. So that, that's a very strong market we think we can capture immediately. The second one is we think this technology can really revolutionize freight. Um, Texas itself, the roads are very congested from freight movement, whether that's from Laredo um, on the border or that's or to Houston or DFW Airport. Um, there are a lot of key areas that have a lot of freight movement, and so we think this will help increase safety in the region by taking some of those trucks on the road, putting it in a dedicated uh, freight mover, and generally relieving congestion on the roads. The land acquisition issues that you're referring to um, absolutely would have to happen on any project like this. The way we look at it is that um, this issue of right-of-way acquisition and land uh, land acquisition to do and implement large infrastructure projects is essentially table stakes at doing any major project in the United States. So while that would be an issue that Hyperloop One would have to go through, they would have to go through that issue no matter where they try to do something like this in the United States. Uh, but the benefit of Texas is that our topography is generally very flat. So because of that, you don't have any major mountains or rivers or lakes that you have to go through, which would help drive down construction costs and maintenance costs for the whole technology. Um, in addition, the proposal that we're offering for Hyperloop Texas is um, an elevated Hyperloop system on a platform. So it is uh, elevated on pylons throughout most of Texas. And obviously this allows for free flowing kind of traffic and agriculture to occur underneath the line. So it doesn't split land. Um, the footprint itself of the actual technology is also smaller than traditional other forms of transportation like high speed rail or heavy rail and commercial rail. Um, so the actual footprint itself is smaller, which would ease somewhat of the burden of land acquisition. Everyone in this industry knows, and even probably people in the public can feel it, that there's something coming in transportation. The model that we've been relying on since World War II, this autocentric American culture, we're really at a tipping point. We can't build highways out of our congestion issues anymore. And the technology is finally caught up. Something is going to give, whether it's autonomous vehicles or Hyperloop or even you know more traditional modes like high-speed rail. Something is about to change fundamentally in the way we move in this country. And Hyperloop, One, we think, is definitely one of those leading candidates to be one of those transformative technologies. So for us, it's very exciting because we all know something is coming and to be kind of leading on that cutting edge with trying to figure out what this may look like, um, our team is really excited about it. We're on the verge of something big in transportation and mobility. And um, yeah, I think 10 years from down the road, we're gonna be like, man, this guy thought this was a crazy idea, but everyone's riding in Hyperloops these days.